and that's about. So, pleasure now to invite Julia and Hamish McKenzie from Braemar Station, up in the uh, in the McKenzie country in the lakes area leading up towards Mount Cook. Uh, recently, uh, last year, were a winner in one of the uh, uh, environmental award categories, and both are heavily involved in uh, the P2P through the advanced parties in the McKenzie Advanced Party, and Julia sits on the Animal Health Stewardship Group as a um, as a voice of, of, of on farm reasons. So welcome, and uh, let's hear about Braemar. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'll cover uh, the um, farm details, some history of Braemar, and uh, where it all started, and where are we now, and Ju will cover some accommodation, environmental effects, and where to next. Um, so my parents purchased Braemar in 1969, uh, very similar story to Mosh and Anna's. Um, it was uh, it was very run down, no fertiliser history. I think um, about seven main blocks and a few reasonably insignificant paddocks. Uh, Mum and Dad brought Braemar, knowing that Lake Pukaki was going to be raised, which in turn meant we lost uh, about a thousand acres off the place, and some of that was lucerne paddocks and quite a bit of river flat. Uh, the lake was raised in 1977. Um, at that time, the place was 64,000 acres. Um, as of five years ago, I think it's now 12,000 acres. Well, I know it's 12,000 acres. <laughs> um, so we're now wondering um, 11,000 stock units. The deer farm mum and dad developed in 1981. Uh, they, they purchased a handful of hinds and a stag and in 1985 they built a deer shed, got in what deer they could find and could get in and sold most of them apart from the hinds and that paid for the fencing and the deer and the deer shed I think. Um, so that's sort of the history of where the deer farm came from. Um, Mum and Dad also built a lot of shelter belts uh, re-established the farm area, the wool shed was shifted up in pieces, the, the original homestead was bulldozed into a hole, the uh, new homestead was built, the sheep yards and cattle yards and all the infrastructure was totally rebuilt, about 500 metres above the original one. Oh, slide thingy. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> There's some facts. <laughs> Shit, I'm not used to this game. Uh, so we've been there. There go some hinds that weren't some of the originals. And there's some more hinds. Uh, so yeah, where we where we came from. Um, I grew up as a kid, um, knowing and thinking, or looking back on it, knowing that we were pretty isolated. Twenty six k's of shingle to get to the property from Lake Tikapo. Uh, two wheel drive vehicles, tractors, cars, all that sort of thing. Very distant neighbours. Very few visitors, and uh, certainly no rubber necking people flying drones like we need getting out of. Um, the last 30 years has been a lot of development. Uh, through the whole farm, it, um, recently in the last few years has been a, a substantial amount. There's uh, about 650 odd hectares in the deer farm. Uh, for eight years ago there was no developed paddock at all. Now we have um, just over 100 hectares I think it is developed, so times change. 
Um, one of the challenges with the development, um, mum and dad had the challenges of re-establishing a farm, basically in a, a home. Um, Joe and I've got the challenge of uh, rules and regulations, or a lot more rules and regulations, um, to try and just keep our heads above water, basically. Uh, we're happy where we are. We've, we think we've got a good balance now of tussock country, shelter and paddocks. And, um, but it's, it's always a challenge to try and stay ahead and keep ahead of the game as we've learnt today. That's not my one. Where we are now, we've got, uh, as of this year, we put 950 hinds to a stag, but over 100 stags and 300 odd young deer. Uh, as I said, quarter of the deer farm is, uh, or nearly quarter, is now developed uh, with that balance of land that we like. And as Mush showed, the, the tussock country, which is paramount, paramount to fawning and lambing. In, uh, in the area we live in. Uh, deer certainly fit our, our growth curve, so it's, they're pretty important to us and, and we do enjoy them. Uh, throughout all these development stages, and Ju will cover this more thoroughly, but we're very mindful of, of the environmental impact we're making, um, but we enjoy the challenges of it. Pass you over to Ju. Um, so, oh, got another one. Is that? Yeah. Aim it at them. Oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly we're not tech savvy. Clearly we're not tech savvy. Um, one of the strengths of Braemar is that we have quite a diverse income stream. So we get 40% of our income currently from sheep and sheep. 20% from beef, about 20% from deer, and about 20% from accommodation. So those those 20s f sort of di move around a wee bit, depending on which uh, which income streams up and which ones down. But we're quite comfortable with that um, diversification because it means we've sort of got a wee bit of a foot in a few baskets. Although the problem is we are involved in the tour tourism industry and the farming industry, both of which um, are in the environmental spotlight. So the accommodation business has been going since the early 90s when Carol and Duncan started using old buildings that were no longer being used. Just because we are in such a spectacular location, people were wanting to stay there. So the old shearers' quarters in an old cottage were done up and people started bringing their sleeping bags and coming and staying. Over the years we've increased this to the stage now where I have um, four cottages and we can sleep 38 people. Um, the Alps Ocean started five years ago and that goes past our gate, so we've jumped on board with that and part of that means I'm now running, doing dinner, bed and breakfast and pack lunch for cyclists because they don't like to carry gear um, and trying to mix all that in along with our overseas international guests that we've always had. Um, so in some ways when you look at Braemar and what, what we're trying to achieve, it's a family farm, so when you've got a family farm, you have very long-term thinking because it's never your intention to sell them. You don't want to be the generation that does that. So therefore, all your, um, all your strategic thinking becomes very long-term because you're thinking about getting it on to the next generation. Um, so therefore, we spend a bit of time trying to identify our business's strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I've just been through the process of doing a farm environment plan um, we had one a few years ago, but basically it was a token gesture that sat in the bottom of the drawer. So we've had another go, go at it, um, and this has really helped identify some of our property strengths, some of our weaknesses, and given us ideas on how we're going to tackle them. Um, I was really excited to hear this morning that DINS is um, prepared to put more money into the environmental area. It's certainly an area that we're going to need to have um, more investment in. Um, we're going to need, as I said, boots on the ground would be great, but also if our experience in the Mackenzie has shown that once a rule's written, even if it's a draft rule, it's quite hard to get it changed. So we need to be in there as an industry right at the policy level to make sure that unreasonable things are getting sorted out earlier rather than later. Um, what 
else am I going to cover? Uh, so we've got quite a unique environment in that it, in the Mackenzie Basin, we're probably a little bit unusual. We're quite high rainfall. Um, we're also quite heavy soil. So the fact that we finished lambs and finished some deer on a dry land property in the Mackenzie is probably a little bit unusual. Uh, but we've got a good balance of rolling country uh, with good native cover on blocks, native cover meaning tussocks and matagari, it's, it's oversown and top dress. Um, and then we have about six or 700 he hectares that is in actual developed pasture. Uh, some of the issues we have that are unique to us are the wilding tree problems. We've just spent a lot of money this year uh, working with MPI to take out all our wilding trees. Uh, MPI have put up two, or MPI and ECAN and that have put up two thirds and we've had to pay one third. And in three years time we'll go again to get new reseeders and then again. Uh, we've got a massive seeding source next door so um, it's, a, it's a long term thing that could be quite a difficult one. Um, it also is quite difficult because in our region planting trees is not really an option for that reason um, because unless they are guaranteed, I mean in fact our district plan doesn't allow us to pl uh, plant conifers at all. So um, the ETS therefore for us is quite an interesting proposition, I'm not quite sure how to sort that one. So as I said, it's, for us it's all about the future. Success for us um, is leaving our property in a state that we're proud of, that our, that our Mish's parents are proud of, and one that gives us a, an income and a viable business that should one of the children choose to take it over or want to be involved, they have that option. Um, so that, that's what we're aiming towards, and all, our, uh, all the stuff we're doing is uh, trying to protect our business uh, viability and our environmental sustainability. <laughs>